些年长的法友，以及有一些高危的人群，他们还是会容易受到这个传染病的感染的。所以，请大家也为他们着想。如果你在参会期间感到身体不舒服，比如说喉咙痛、呃、发烧、呃呃、那请你尽快的离开现场。Um, if you do become sick during the event, just pop on an N95 mask and leave. If you require any extra help, you can go to the help desk in the foyer. Um, they have masks there, and also they've got uh, COVID rap tests as well. 如果你在参会期间感到身体不适，请立马啊戴上 N95 的口罩。你可以在服务台那边领取这个口罩。In recommendation with New South Wales health guidelines, we do invite you all to wear a mask, as this is a very crowded public space. Um, but masks aren't mandatory, but we ask that you, um, you think of everyone around you, and if you're worried, please protect yourself. That's the most important thing to do. 根据新南威尔士州的呃健康指南建议，我们建议大家在会议法会期间都戴口罩。虽然这不是不是一个强制性的要求，但是希望大家呃为了保护自己和他人的安全，都遵从这个规定。Hand sanitizer is available outside the toilet blocks and also reception. 在洗手间的外面，还有呃这个接待台的那边都可以有这个洗手消毒液。If first aid is required, all the security staff have trained first aid officers. And in the event of an emergency or evacuations required, all the staff working here, the town hall staff, they will guide you what to do. 呃，如果遇到任何的紧急情况，呃，这边的工作人员会指领指领大家撤离现场，请大家听从安排。Um, bottled water and covered drinks are acceptable, but preferably please don't eat in here. You can eat outside. 你可以把水杯、水瓶带带进来，但请要把盖子拧好，但是不要在会场吃东西。如果你要吃东西的话，请在会场外面。Each day, you will be given a different colored wristband. Um, please wear it or keep it very handy, as you'll need to show this to re-enter the venue, um, especially during lunch break. Uh, 每一天报道的时候，你会领到一个手环，那请你记得随时佩戴你的手环，因为你进入会场的时候一定要展示你的手环才能进入会场。特别是当你休息或者午餐的时候离开了会场，然后重要需要重新进入的时候，你必须要有这个手环才能进入。We anticipate there'll be a short break this morning, so um, yeah, if you could be prompt back after the break, that would be wonderful. Uh, we'll also be reorganizing the whole venue to this afternoon for the empowerments tomorrow. So we request that you take all your possessions with you. Uh, uh, Chloe is just going to give a quick announcement to the Chinese people regarding the uh, Zoom in, uh, Mandarin interpretation. Uh, we'll be expecting Rinpoche in about five minutes, so if everyone could just keep their seats and... Uh, be quiet, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Welcome, Rinpoche. A very warm welcome to you in Sydney, Australia. First of all, I would just like to um, introduce Craig Madden. He is from the Sydney Metropolitan Land Council, representing the Gadigal people, and will be doing Welcome to Country. Uh, Thank you, Craig. Thank you. What am I? Bujiri Gamarua. G'day and welcome. My name is Craig Madden, and I'd like to start by thanking um, Sadat Intent for inviting me here today to welcome you onto country. I'm a proud Bunjalung Gadigal man from the Eora Nation, and Gadigal land is a land on which we are gathered here today. Jinyura Gadigal. This land is Gadigal. It is uh, customary for our Aboriginal people as we invite guests or visitors onto our land or country, that we offer you safe passage as you pass through our lands. So I was a proud Gadigal man and a representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council. I'd like to welcome you all to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. I'd like to pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging and honour the stories and traditions of our Aboriginal people from this land. I'd also like to acknowledge our ancestors who watch over us as we walk on these sacred lands. To our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, if we have any brothers and sisters from the Torres Strait Islands, welcome. To all our non-Aboriginal brothers and sisters here today, a warm and sincere welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Our Gadigal clan is one of the 29 clans which make up the Eora Nation, and that's a nation that's bound by three distinct landmarks. So we have the Hawkes River to the north, the Nepean River out to the west, and the Georges River down to the south, and within the boundaries of those mighty rivers lie our Eora Nation and the land of our Gadigal people that we are standing on, and one of the many clans of that nation. To our guests from across the seas, from those of you from across our great country, great states, this beautiful city of ours, welcome to Gadigal land, Aboriginal land. Um, I hope you all enjoy the day today. I think it's going to be amazing, as I'm sure you all know. But um, on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and its Gadigal mob, um, travel safely for those travelling this afternoon. And once again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Today we are honoured and privileged to have in our midst a truly remarkable teacher and guru alike, Zonzi Kensi Rinpoche. Ladies女士们,先生们,女孩们,男孩们,非常欢迎大家来到现场。今天我们非常荣幸地邀请到一位真正非常了不起的老师和上师,中夏讲扬清真元波切。we are delighted to welcome you back to Australia, Rinpoche, and please continue your precious activities here. For those of you who are new students or listeners, Zonza Kensi Rinpoche, also known as Kensi Norbu, is a widely respected Buddhist scholar and teacher, acclaimed filmmaker and author of several books. Rinpoche is known for his modern, progressive, and sometimes provocative approach to teaching the Dharma. Zonzakensurinpoche has been the student of many great Tibetan Buddhist masters, including Kabje Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche, Kabje Sakya Trizen, Kabje Dujon Rinpoche, and the 16th Kamapa. He is the head of the renowned Zongza Monastery and College and is currently responsible for the education of approximately 3,000 monks distributed between six monasteries and institutes in Asia. 
呃，中山延波切从许多著名的藏传藏藏传佛教上师那里领受法教，包括顶顶果钦者法王、萨迦崔金法王、敦珠延波切和第十六世噶玛巴。嗯，延波切主管著名的中萨寺和中萨佛学院，他也。在培育和教育，呃，培养和教育着在亚洲六所六所寺院，一共三千名的僧众。Rinpoche oversees Siddhartha's intent and contemporary teaching and practice centers established in several continents, as well as the non-profit organizations Kensi Foundation and 84,000, focusing on translating the words of the Buddha and Lotus Outreach that finds education and empowerment for impoverished women and children. 中赛仁波切呃指导悉达多本院会的工作，同时也负责主呃，同时也负责管理啊、呃、在几大洲建立的当代佛法教学和修行的中心。啊、呃，仁波切还创创建了几个非盈利的组织，包括呃八千四八万四千将佛法的佛陀的教言翻译成现代的语言，还有莲心基金会致力于救助难民还有受困的富余。In the presence of Rinpoche, we find inspiration and wisdom. So let us open our hearts and minds to embrace the teachings that are graciously shared with us today. Rinpoche's appearance brings us inspiration and wisdom. So let us open our hearts and minds to embrace the teachings that are graciously shared with us today. Thank you for joining us on this sacred journey of learning and discovery. Please join me in extending a heartfelt welcome to Zonza Kensi Rinpoche. I hope today's meeting will guide us to the truth. I hope we can thank the Rinpoche for bringing us life's wisdom and the truth. And let us welcome the Rinpoche to the Rinpoche to the Rinpoche to the Rinpoche. Thank you for the very exaggerated, at times, introduction. I'm expressing, <clears throat> I want to express my joy and um, gratitude for being here again in Australia. Sydney especially. This country is one of the earliest um, country outside of Himalayas that I visited. I had so many incredible memories. I have to express one memory. When I taught up in the um, Lismore area, one of, this, uh, one of those days. I had about six, seven people listening to me. And um, teaching was announced, something like 6, of, 6 p.m., but people showed up only about 8. <laughs> and then... <clears throat> Many of them even have sleeping bags. <laughs> and they were all like lying down in front of me, most of them. Some, one of them was sitting very straight, like meditating, I think, <laughs> supposedly. And I don't know whether he's even listening to whatever I'm saying. And um, sometimes I feel that maybe they're all sleeping. But time to time, a hand will come out from the sleeping bag, <laughs> interrupting the, the conversation because they have questions. So I have a lot of very, very interesting and good-hearted people from, you know, places like Nimban, Byron Bay, um, Kayogol. So. 
this sort of uh, impact is really, really strong. Can, is, it, it stays, and, and I think it will stay for a long time. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I have walked outside of uh, Q, uh, Queen Victoria building and gazed at that there many, many times as a tourist. Never really thought, and of course I've been past this uh, town hall many times because there, I think on that side, there's some movie cinemas and that's where I go quite a lot. But I've never thought that one day I will be talking to people in this building. So what such a, it's such a big deal for me. <coughs> I'm supposed to talk about mind training. Uh, the title has something to do with the seven points of mind training. This seven steps, seven this, seven that, that's sort of a marketing gimmick, so don't worry so much about this, <laughs> I will say. Um, but before we go into this, I think there's one big challenge. Um, apart, I don't know, maybe there are a few Bhutanese I see, I saw them earlier, and um, I don't know whether there are any Tibetans. <clears throat> Um, most of you, um, and when I say word Westerner, I don't mean people who, have, who are Caucasian, whatever. I'm, I actually mean Chinese, Indians, all of them, because this is a little bit sarcasm probably. I find many young Chinese and Indians are more westernized than the westerners themselves. So the way they, so what I'm saying is the usage of the mind, word mind is going to be a bit of a challenge. Even with the young Bhutanese and Himalayans, the word mind, what, what do we mean by mind? So they, this is going to be a bit of a challenge. You and I don't, I don't think we'll come to a conclusion today in short hours, short time, some sort of a cohesive mutual agreement, what, do, what I meant when I say mind. But nevertheless, I will try to sort of explain my way. Um, and it's quite important. Mind is very important. Um, if, you, if you don't have this mind business, then basically most of the Asian Eastern philosophy, especially a wisdom tradition coming from India, may not have much of a ground, really, especially Buddhism. I would probably, I think I can confidently say Buddhism along with some other traditions such as Jainism and I would say even Taoist, Taoism in China, these are some of the wisdom tradition that may have paid attention to phenomena called mind. We are talking about two, three thousand years before. And, and I would say one thing that they do have enough experience and I would say probably even authority to discuss about this mind. Um, at least just to create some sort of a <clears throat> disagreement point, you know. I have studied Buddhism ever since very young and I put, I, and as I grow up, especially in the Buddhist philosophy as, uh, training, I could safely say just, just on mind, I have probably studied, just intellectually of course, more than 11 years. And I have to say I'm still studying because it is 
not uh, the most sort of easy subject also. Uh, in fact, as many of you know here, and by the way, this is going to be a little challenging because I also see a lot of old diehard Buddhists and I think there are some totally new and that's going to be challenging for me to, I don't know, address both. Anyway, I was going to say, actually in Buddhism, there are many different schools. They all are basically have a fundamentally one view, but they have a different sort of approach. And, they, and there are many different schools. Some are very, very historically very, you know, influential. And one such school is called mind-only school. Can you believe there's actually a Buddhist tradition or a school called mind-only school? So you can see how much mind is so emphasized. Um, but this, as I said, mind is going to be difficult because I think uh, you and I need to really dis discuss quite a lot of things about this mind. Um, many times, mind is very, very elusive and uh, how should I put it? It's like time. You know, time sort of exists, has to, right? Otherwise, you will not be here 10 o'clock in the morning. But at the same time, even Western modern scientists themselves have come to the conclusion that time is relative. By the way, I should define this. Relative truth, relative, the idea relative. For Buddhists, relative is synonymous to illusion. Illusion. A relative means it's an illusion. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's an illusion, it's, and it's actually very close to hallucination. So I could say time is a hallucination. Time is an illusion. Okay, mildly. Time is relative. And this is very important. Um, I just noticed a um, very, very kind and old friend, Hal Sperling here. We have discussed this before. Um, if, you know, like for instance, if yesterday's you and today's you or me, are we the same thing or are, they, are we different? You can't really say we are same. We can't also say we are different. We have some vague notion called continuity. And I'm sure Hal can, uh, I don't know, we can have interesting uh, what, uh, discussions about this because one could always argue you, you, you commit a crime yesterday and then police found today and then you can always say, hey, that's, that was m different. You know, yesterday's me, today's me is innocent. I don't have to go to prison, so on and so forth. So I just want to tell you the time is an illusion. Similarly, sipping a coffee, I don't know, in a nice Byron Bay, Bondi Beach coffee shop, time goes very fast. In a prison, time goes very slow. So all these sort of indicates time is relative, time is illusion, etc. So if we could sort of comprehend that, mind is a bit like this. So this is one thing I just want to tell you this first. There are a few Im important details. <clears throat> um, you see, okay, first of all, obviously, you all know the new ones. This is a Buddhist discourse. So for Buddhists, um, 
the concept called reincarnation is important. By the way, I have to stress this. The word reincarnation in English, um, that's a very dodgy word. And um, I think it's not uh, translating very well uh, what um, the Tibetan or the Dharma Sanskrit word, you know, like the Tibetan word Yangtze, which Yangtze actually means sort of continuous exists, you know? Yesterday's crime, today you go to prison, you know, on that, on that sort of um, manner. So, because I think the idea of reincarnation comes from uh, some sort of automatic decision that there is a soul that's sort of going through but you see, the Buddhists don't really believe in soul, right? Definitely not truly existing soul. So, see, there's that. But if you, anyway, as a Buddhist, if you don't believe in so-called reincarnation, Yangtze, okay? Just keep in mind, I don't like the word reincarnation, but I, I will still use it because somehow we need to fill up our time till one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, for Buddhists, if you don't have reincarnation, if there is no continuity, mind training is pointless. Sure, you can, you can train mind so that you can behave nice, be kind of, you know, happy this life. That is never the Buddhist aim, which we will discuss later. Um, it's not really, you know, being happy is never really the point for Buddhism. This is important. I need to quote this from Chandrakirti, one of the greatest scholar in Buddhism, seventh century. He said, if you are an idiot, you will do bad things and go to hell. If you are idiot, you will do good things and go to heaven. Both idiot. If you are wise, you will go beyond good and bad and get liberation. You see, so for Buddhists, the aim is different. Um, you have to really, excuse me, I'm, you know, my thread is not so good, you know. Someone tried to teach me something called PowerPoint or something like that, <laughs> and I'm not good with that too, because I don't know how to sort of fiddle with the machine. Anyway, and so you can always raise your, what is it, um, hand and try to align me. Um, yes, this is what I was saying. Mind, for the Buddhist, reincarnation, you know, continuity is very important. That is the main, that because of that, because of the, the hallucination of continuity, hallucination of time, hallucination of all that, because of that, you need the mind training, or the mind training works. So when the Buddhists hear from, let's say, Westerner, a scientist who says, oh, you know, there is no past life, there's no future life, okay? There's no future life, there's no past life. Yet, they strongly quote Einstein, time is relative. Buddhists think it's a contradiction. Time is relative, and yet you say, this is the end. That Buddhist thing is a contradiction. You understand? But anyway, I just want to tell you these things, this as a background, where I'm coming from. You, you, you don't have to agree. I'm sure you, many of you are already confused because the way I'm talking. Um, 
So, yes. So, the definition of mind, yes, I should tell you this. It's interesting, philology, I guess. Um, the Tibetan word for sentient being is sem gem. This is a very interesting word. Sem means mind, okay, loosely. Chen actually means one that has it. So when so the word sem chen actually means one that has mind, meaning the body. The body has mind, then it's called alive, living. So now we have to actually come discuss about so-called living, but we will not go through there. We will go back to the mind training, I promise. But anyway, just keep in mind, um, it's an it's a interesting filio, what you, uh, definition. Okay, but at least between you and me, one thing perhaps we can come to an agreement is that you and I have what we call vaguely mind, which this table doesn't have. So this table is not necessarily feeling romantic because of this rose here, right this moment. This table will not feel rejected if I'm not using any of this. This table will not feel left out. If another better table is brought here, this table will not feel jealous. If we all leave this house, this table will feel not lonely, so on and so forth. But we will, right? So this, I, at least we can come to an agreement that we have something called cognizance, this mind. And that mind of yours is sort of stuck with you. You can't really switch it off. You can, if you don't like your arms, chop it off. You can cut your nail, you can cut your hair, not mind. Yes, you can sort of go in coma, you can sort of um, make yourself dull a little bit with outer help, but it doesn't really mean you don't have a mind. You can, okay, deep sleep, for instance. Feels like you have no, but you do still have mind. So this is something we are stuck, okay? We are stuck, we cannot eject it. We cannot, for a moment, we cannot sort of, okay, pause the mind. So in this way, mind is a little bit of a nuisance. Because you keep on feeling something. You keep on feeling agitated. You keep on feeling anxious. You keep on feeling jealous. You, can, you keep on feeling hopeful. You keep on feeling afraid, so on and so forth. But you ask a Buddhist, Buddhist will say, oh no, this mind is so precious. And in fact, the Buddha, now this is coming from majority of the a Buddhist um, tradition that prevailed in Himalayas, China, Japan, Korea, they will say, this mind is Buddha. So when the Buddhists say, I want to be, you know, when the Buddhists say, I want a liberation, it actually means I want to have my mind in my hand, so to speak. I want to have my mind back. Because right now, our mind is just everywhere, something like this. Our mind is totally wrapped with all kinds of situation and the influence. But for a Buddhist, if you can get your mind back in your hand, then that's good. That's already enlightenment. That's liberation. That's Buddhahood. Of course, of course, um, like this statue, there are Buddha's representation with a very amazing 
skin color like gold, and some lump on their head. Some Buddhas are female, some has 16 arms, some have three eyes, some have seven eyes, blah, 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 all of that. Those are symbolic. Symbolism is so important because we need to talk to idiots. You can only communicate with language and symbolism. I don't mean you are, you are <laughs> idiots. Well, I, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But idiots also changes, you know. They are sophisticated idiots, they are the worst. <laughs> and they are very like, kind of, what do you call it, idiot, idiots. Those are the one actually the Buddhist masters they like. <laughs> but anyway, again, I'm going everywhere. Um, so yes, so that's it. You have your mind in your hand. That's what it is. And can you do that? Yes. Can you do that? Yes. And that's why the mind training, the how to do it. And actually, it can be so simple. Look at this rose right this very moment and know that you are looking at it. You have done it. For a momentarily, you have your mind in your hand. But of course, you can always think, oh, where did they got this flower? It looks like artificial, or it is maybe too much, what do you call it? Mm. All the way, you know, this shop, that shop, that shop is better, this shop is not so good, they cheated me last year, <laughs> all that. Then, of course, you have lost, right? So, in this way, they, you can actually do it, and there is a so many, many, many ways of mind training. So many ways. As I said earlier, seven points of mind training is some sort of a gimmick just to make you feel not overwhelmed. Oh, it's only seven. I can do this. <laughs> Actually, one will also do. There is just so many different ways. So, but, you know, nowadays, a lot of people seem to think mind training means sit, breathe, so-called meditate, close eyes, this method just had a lot of good marketing people. That's all, actually. It's like Starbucks coffee. You understand? It just had a good marketing strategy. So everybody is now rushing. Probably it's the Zafu company, I'm telling you. The meditation cushion. <laughs> cushion company, they may be behind it. You understand? You never know this whole mindfulness business. We never know, it's, you know, commercial, consumer society. It's quite, we never know. And the incense, right? And also some resorts. It's a very good selling point. So, but actually it can be in many ways. I know a lot of people will have hard time to believe prayer flag that in Himalayas you see everywhere, that are, those are incredibly, uh, you know, good mind training. Prayer wheels, statues, stupas, I don't know, sand powder mandala, the complicated ones. And uh, not just in the Himalayas, um, not just Himalayas, go, let's go beyond. Zen garden in Japan, or the flower arrangement, Akibana, very much mind training. And talking about Japanese, actually, I have to do this. Um, poetry, writing a poetry is a mind training. I will tell you how. I was trying to search for this one. This is written by a Japanese Zen master called Basho. And this is his poetry. First day of spring, 
I keep thinking about the end of autumn. That's a, that is a, such a beautiful mind training because that's what we do. You know, let me read some more because I like these poetry. <laughs> and the, another one, the Basho. And this is a famous, many people know. The old pond, a frog jump in, sound of water. Very much here and now and simple. No gold color, no halos, none of this stuff. You know, it's very simple now. And this guy, Isa Kobayashi, my favorite. What a strange thing to be alive beneath cherry blossoms. That's a mind training, I think. Another one, same guy, Isa. How much are you enjoying yourself, tiger moth? Talking to a butterfly, I guess, but I guess moth. Another one, ask how old he was. The boy in the new kimono stretched out all five fingers. One last one. Look, don't kill that fly. It is making a prayer to you by rubbing its hands and feet. <laughs> this is a mind training because people who, these people have actually sort of lived. This is the thing. Mind training really is at the core, it is really knowing how to, and training so that you know how to live. One could easily write and experience like this with a cup of coffee, as you can see. Anyway, mm -hmm. so now for the mind training, First, um, I'm trying to do some mind training myself right this very moment. And the, what I did, just a few moments. Whatever I spoke, speak today, may it somehow go into your ear and somehow at least one or two words will benefit you and may this word also come out from your mouth and go to many, many other people's ears and may it make them sort of get the life get the mind in their hand. Though if you want, you can also, as a listener, you can also train your mind. Write this for a few moments, that whatever you are hearing will sort of benefit yourself and others. So please do that while I sip this. Okay. <clears throat> I'm using some commentaries written, some of them 11th century, some of them 7th century. And um, I was using some commentaries hoping that it will, be, it will help me not to go too astray, but I think I've already gone astray. So also, mm -hmm, after I actually want you to ask questions later, so I will keep in mind uh, to keep the enough time for this. Okay, now.
fits, you need to, a little bit, you need to want to train your mind. Otherwise, this morning is waste for you. You really need to waste, uh, yeah, you really need to, I don't know, want. So you need to see a little bit of value in mind training. You know, from a materialistic and, I don't know, cons you, know com you know, like a economist point of view, mind training is the worst thing that can happen on earth. It will destroy the whole economic system. What even you, I don't know how many people here, 700 something, even 700 people just for this week because you sort of understand that there is much, there's many other things in life such as looking at a fly, you know, rubbing its hand. You may decide not to buy a pair of shoes, 700 shoes. That's not a good news for Amazon. So, from the economy point of view, materialistic point of view, from, I don't know, political point of view, mind training may be not the best. But for your own, what I will stress, for, bene for your own happiness, and more than happiness, for your own benefit. Those two are a little different. More than happiness for your own benefit. Yes, mind training is, I think, valuable. You will need to want it. But this is difficult, by the way, because um, let's say you want to go to um, Byron Bay this weekend, the re you know, for a nice holiday. The reason why you like going to Byron Bay is because perhaps, because you, you have been to Bondi Beach many times. You know what I mean? You have a reference, the Australian waves, Australian bottlefish, Australian enigma of shark, the blue ocean, you know, all that, you know. So you want to experience, you have a reference. So Byron Bay will be similar, maybe a little different, so that's why we go to Byron Bay. You have a reference. Now, most of us, we don't have the reference to refer what will you feel like when your mind is totally trained, and <laughs> you understand? Probably not. So this is the reason why you may not have this incredible desire to want, desire or want, wanting to train your mind. But there's one hope, and that hope is whatever you are going through right now, Yes, of course, you know, things are good, you know, you know, generally, you know, generally, everything is kind of okay. But, you know, especially when you are crossing, uh, you know, middle age, then you begin to realize, is this it? Is this all there is, so-called life? So some sort of a feeling awkward, feeling empty, feeling pointless, feeling, I don't know, just, you know, after all this, is this only thing I, is this the only thing that life has to offer? Something like that. If you have that kind of awkward, kind of a sadness, kind of a, not satisfied with whatever you have, 
I'm not talking about like a new car, okay? That's, yeah, I'm talking about really, you know, like, not satisfied completely with what you have. Then this, according to the Buddhist would say, is a really, really precious. This mindset is going to give you a right direction. This kind of a healthy suspicion, this kind of a healthy, in inquisitive, seeking mind, this kind of mind of not settling with whatever there is out here in front, this probably a lot of you have. Especially, as I said, after a while, this is actually already cultivating this. Not necessarily trying to find a solution. Not necessarily go to a bookshop and get a self-help book. Just watching this sort of I'm satisfied. Is, there, is this all there is? It, it's my head, so I have to express. If you ever watch a um, film by Ozu, it's so beautiful. And um, I have to say this, it, it, will, it will spoil the film, okay? <laughs> Ozu's film, they, the last scene, there's these two girls and they're talking. It's a beautiful film. And then the younger girl asks the older one, is this all there is in so-called life? And then there's a shot of a train coming from one point to another. I thought that is one of the most beautiful, sort of so powerful. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. So <clears throat> this kind of feeling, you know, like awkward, unsatisfied, maybe there's something higher, maybe there's, there's something much more than whatever. Yes. This sort of unsettling, this is good. That's what the somebody like Chekawa, by the way, one of the commentators, is, his name is Chekawa. I think he was born 11th century. He would say, this is so good. As a human being, this will, this will make your life beautiful. This will make you look at flies, you know, rubbing hands. This will make you even notice there is a sound when a frog plop on, you know, on the pond. This will really make you realize, wow, how precious this life is. So that's, I think, quite an important one. Okay, now, as I said earlier, for the Buddhists, mind training is really for liberation. It's really not for calm, stress-free, sort of, I don't know. That's never the point, okay? I know there's a whole industry of mindfulness. And, there's a, and I'm not condemning them. I think it's good. Why not? They are like a Panadol. They are like a massage. They are like a good, you know, swim in a cold ocean. I don't know. Whatever, right? Whatever makes you happy, you know, 
there's no reason to not do it. So, of course, they're good. But the, for the Buddhists, this is never the point. Because For the Buddhists, anything that needs charging is a bad news. Because you will always have to look for a PowerPoint. <laughs> and <laughs> battery runs out, and then you are already in panic. So this kind of a week and 10 days, vipassana, blah, 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 mindfulness retreat, I don't know, in some spa, sure, why not? But it's not going to, it will need recharging again. So we will actually have, I think for the Buddhists, um, uprooting the cause of this continuous anxiety continuous sort of um, delusion, that is important. So for the Buddhist, liberation. Now, many of you have heard me tell you, said this many, many times, so it will be just one of another repetition for many of you, but for, for the sake of new ones, for the Buddhist, I said, again, liberation is important. But when we say liberation, what do we mean by that? Really, it has got nothing to do with going to another place. It's really not nothing to do with um, you gain some sort of extra intelligence or extra power or any of that. Although, as I said earlier, many times Buddhist iconography, representation, symbolic teachings may have that kind of, you know, communication, but in reality it is not. Buddha stated this many times. So for the Buddhist, liberation is actually knowing the truth. That's it. Just knowing the truth. Mm, like a kids, get got scared, let's say, uh, inside a theater where there is a dance of a demon and noise and the color and the dance makes the kid very scared. Next, the kid goes backstage and sees the person is taking off the mask. Oh, this is not a real demon. The truth is realized. The kid will not be scared anymore, something like that. So knowing the truth is so, it is what we call liberation. And when we talk about the truth, again, this is important, especially for the new ones I'm telling you, we are not talking about any kind of exotic truth, exotic mythical truth, very, 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 mundane truth. You and I are going to die. That's one truth out of many truths. Worse than you and I going to die is we don't know when we are going to die. Yes, sure, of course, we can exercise, eat right food, eat right vitamins, and try to do all this, but none of that them actually guaranteed, you know, forever living or whatever. You understand? That, that kind of. But not just sort of 
sad and pessimistic truth, which I just said, which Buddhists tend to speak a lot. But some, you know, because everything is changeable, everything is always changing. If you are sad right now, if you are depressed right now, it's going to change. That is the truth. And many times not accepting this truth, we go to shrinks, we pop up pills, we go to classes like this. We do all kinds of, we apply all kinds of methods and then could make it even worse. We could, we could actually get entangled more. Instead of accepting the truth, we try to find camouflage, a way of camouflaging the truth. That's one. It's very, very down to earth truth we are talking about. Nothing, some, we are not talking about there's a, some light inside your heart or anything like that. The other truth, I have, to, I have to, this is part of the, you know, mind training. And this is actually the most important, knowing this truth. The other truth is, nothing is going to satisfy you 100%, nothing. Yes, sure, it will satisfy you and give you bliss for a certain time, but it's not going to give you 100% happiness. You may know this intellectually, but habitually you don't know. That's why we are always trying to fix things, fix our sinks, fix our relationship, fix our, I don't know, lots of things. Actually, if you pay attention, one day, in one whole day, all we do is just fix, 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 fix. And then, while you fix one, other also gets, other falls apart. And then you ask other people to fix. Of course, they make a big mess out of this. And when they make, sometimes when they make big mess out of the problem you have, you even wholeheartedly offer your gratitude. <laughs> or, of course, lawsuit and etc. all of that. So, but anyway, there is this. Just habitually, maybe you know nothing will satisfy you 100%. I mean, intellectually, you will know, but habitually, difficult to sink into our head. But this is another truth. The, uh, another, the other truth is whatever appears, however you project, what, whatever the opinion you have is not what really is. Wow, this is a big one. This is a really, really big one. And I have been noticing lack of understanding this truth is really driving the whole world mad. When I say how it appears is not how it is, I'm not talking about things like, okay, maybe, you know, you look at a architecture design. You think it's beautiful, but actually it's not beautiful. Be that's small. That's very, very, that, that's almost harmless. There are so many others. Our values, our moral, what do you call it? Values, un so-called universal values. And then politicians, of course, they have to, they take this as an opportunity. And then the medias, and then the experts, 
And then one part of the world imposing their value to the rest of the world that this is the only way. This is the truth. No, not really. Do you understand? It's like, you know, something may be valuable for somewhere, but it's not really well working in the different parts of the world. This is a big one, actually. But anyway, how it appears is not how it is. I think this, I think the way I'm presenting in this uh, way is very simplified. So don't think that this is the, this is the sort of the end of Buddhism, but this is, I'm trying to make it simple. So this is the truth. And understanding this truth is what we call um, um, understanding this truth, not just intellectually, but actually, habitually, habitually. And this is doable. This is very doable. And that actually is a very big part of the mind training. Anyway, I was talking about for Buddhists, aim is for liberation, not for just happiness. So in this context, I would say for Buddhists, liberation, not falling into false narration is beneficial for you. Falling into false narration, falling into getting distracted by false information, false appearance might make you happy and blissful, but it's not beneficial for you. Yes, we are not saying you should not have it. Yes, by all means, watch Netflix. By all means, you know, open an account on TikTok. By all means, do all of that. But we need to also have something that benefits you, such as knowing, such as like going to Queen's Victoria building and um, thinking, okay, this may be my last day because I might not come back here forever. Not because, you know, you will not get an Australian visa or anything like that. <laughs> Just because tonight you might uh, swallow, um, I don't know, prawn or a cucumber even, and got stuck on your throat, and you never even managed to make to hospital. That is possible. And then, Next time, from the Buddhist point of view, when you visit Q Queen Victoria building, you will be a moth. And the, from the moth's point of view, what is Queen? <laughs> what is Victoria? For moth, moth has all <laughs> together different worlds, all different you know, values, all different narrations. Right? And then, so that's why for the Buddhists, mind training is um, really for the liberation. Okay, gosh, we haven't even managed to come to the actual way of, med, you know, um, mind training. Okay, let's begin. So, Chenam Milam Tabursam. That's it. That's a very important one. Really, really important. Chenam Milam Tabursam. Which means mind training. Really quintessential. You need to really tell yourself, educate yourself, and think again and again.
I need to sort of decipher this. Mm. I will use the classic Buddhist example. So this has four legs, a plank, and at this point, my butt is not on it. At this point, my things are on it. You call it a table. Buddhist think, all phenomena is just like that. Okay, change the, change the atmosphere now. I put my butt on it. Right from the day, you know, from the beginning, let's say, I'm sitting on it. You may think, wow, Rinpoche is sitting on a really simplified chair or a throne even. See, conditioning. The condition has made you think table is a throne. Basically, everything, father, mother, boyfriend, girlfriend, democracy, human rights, money, whatever, values, phones, I don't know, uh, friends, uh, sadness, uh, failure, success, everything is basically just like that. Cause and condition put together, like four legs, plank, somebody actually using it at using it as a table, it's a table. But if nobody is using this as a table and somebody else is using this as, I don't know, something else, then it is something else. This is why, so this is something that we have to get used to. Think everything, okay, my opinion, my values, my judgment, not only mine, society's judgment, group concessions, all of this is basically cause, condition, put together. It's a bit like rabbit coming from the head. Whatever you want, actually, you can create. Basically, the classic Chonamilam Tabursam, basically, that uh, the word I was I'm reciting again and again, Chonam Milam Tabrusam. Actually, if I translate it, uh, means you one should think all phenomena are like a dream. Dream. In the, you see, when I say these are just sort of put together and then it became like that. It doesn't mean that your order, your structure will fall apart. No, not at all. Structure, order, quantity, quality, they themselves are put together and they will stay intact. And I've used this example a lot. If you go, if you are dreaming, drinking a cup of tea, that dream cup will hold the dream tea. Just because it's a dream doesn't mean that the cup will leak, tea will leak. But that doesn't mean you, 700 people will dream 700 cup of tea not leaking. Doesn't make this dream cup of tea real. So that's how things are. This is actually quite an um, important one. This one, okay. Now, some of you may think, okay, well, kind of makes sense, okay. But how do we actually, how do, how do I get this in my habitual mind? Right? That's the question. You can't be like going to a shopping and say, okay, everything is just made up like a table. You can't, if somebody pinch your boyfriend's bottom, you can't be thinking, okay, he, you know, so his hand is made out of, you know, colors and conditions. 
jealousy, anger will erupt, you understand? So this kind of intellectual information is good time to time, you can listen, but practically what can we do? Okay, the next one. So there are many, many, many ways to do, a lot of, lot of different methods, but before we take a break, we, we are going to take a break soon. I think we should, because I've been talking too much. And um, <laughs> practically, what can we do all the time, every day? And this, I'm not making up. Huh? This is 2,500 years method. Practically, you don't have to decipher, you don't have to intellectually tell yourself, okay, these are made out of my, made by my mind, these are illusion, because that becomes a mantra. That's not going to help. So practically, what, what can you do? Okay, I will choose one, which is most, one of the most popular one. There are few. I will choose uh, when, after we come back, another popular one. But first, the very, very popular one, which is whatever is in your mind right this very moment. Just know that. Do not judge. Do not get entangled with this thought. Don't think about the past. Don't think about the future. Just whatever is in your mind, right this very moment, such as babies crying, such as you trying to find out what are you thinking, such as, I don't know, whatever, something. It doesn't have to be anything exotic, holy, nothing, just something so simple. And knowing that, but as you know it, try not to prolong, just simply knowing it. Okay, let's do this for one minute, and I don't, I, I'm not going to ask you to sit straight and all of that, I'm not going to ask you for this one. Just do it, just however you are sitting. Okay, that's good. So, how does, how can this help? Very much, why? Because when you are just watching whatever is in your thought this very moment, but not go to the past, not go to the future, not get entangled, not judge, what are you doing? You are not feeding the thoughts. When you feed the thoughts, you are constructing the table. Remember, I was, the example, four legs, the plank, and then the good table, the bad table, values, all stories. So, just being there will deprive your entanglement. Deprive your stories. This is a very, very, actually one of the most revered method. Um, let's take a break.
gentlemen, please take your seats. 大家请尽快就坐。哦、oh, ，哎，哦。大家请尽快。Everybody, please take your seats. We are about to begin. 大家请尽快就坐，严伯切即将入场。严伯切。Oh. <laughs> okay, we can go. Okay, while people are sitting, maybe we can do some question. So people don't feel that they're missing something. Okay, so we're going to have a quick question and answer. If people could please ask their questions uh, concisely and relevantly, thank you. We've got two mics in both aisles. Um, if a handful, you know, a few people could just queue up behind them, and then Chloe will translate into Chinese. Thank you. In English. Uh -oh. Hello, 如果是中文问题的话，会翻译成英文，所以大家也可以用中文提问。Remote, what is enlightenment? I think I think that um, question, what is enlightenment? Probably I have already answered earlier when I'm talking about how seeing the truth is basically the liberation. I think that's good. I think that's all I can do for now. I mean, we can go really, really technical and deeper, but maybe at this point, not really necessary. Okay, any more question? Um, yeah. Is it even possible to actually train our minds with all of the distractions and influences we constantly have to face? Okay, so this is, um, is it even possible to train our mind? Okay, that's very good. And I think using that as a sort of a, a lead, I'm going to actually go on with the, um, the, the, the mind training thing, whatever I'm supposed to be talking, a little bit, a little bit more. Mm. Uh, but I will. I know there's many questions, but um, 
I think there are some questions coming from outside, looks like, right? So we will do this. Um, but um, uh, please hold on to the rest of the questions. So I'm going to answer this question first. Uh, is it even possible to um, train mind? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, so you can actually sit because it's going to take some time. People can actually s yeah. <laughs> see. Okay. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> is it even possible to train mind? Yes. Um, this is how the Buddhists see. Although mind that we know of which is on the most subtle level, <coughs> always thinking of something, like the noise. <coughs> Other people moving, air condition, lights, or more gross things like uh, anger, I don't know, depression, sadness, whatever. Even though this is mind that we know of. This. But that's actually the only the surface. This is, I'm only giving, I'm giving the Buddhist view of mind. That's how the mind kind of looks like for you. It's like, it's like, how should I put it? Like a rainbow. The rainbow looks like, you know, colorful, all of that. But then, if you go closer to the rainbow, with a, I don't know, <clears throat> really get close and see what is there, then you have another layer, the true, let's call it, let's call it the true side of the rainbow. Moisture, whatever, the sunlight, etc., etc. So, mind that we know of, is this, thinking, observing, feeling, anger, desire, etc. This is what we know of, you and I know. But Buddhists think that that's only on surface, that's just a manifestation of mind. The actual mind, now this is maybe difficult for the newcomers to easily understand, but anyway, try. The actual mind is not at all, like uh, definitely not desire, not anger, not jealousy, none of this. Actual so-called mind is just a cognizance, that's it. It's just a pure cognizance. Yes, yes, we do sort of have a um, we have a prejudice towards mind that is, let's say, aggression. We don't like it. We do have prejudice and think mind that is romantic, loving, we like it, right? We have that kind of prejudice. But whether you can accept it or not, both bad mind, aggression, and good mind, romantic love, whatever, these two are actually just cognizance. 
on that level, they are equal. So it's a bit like Ethiopian beans coffee or, or Colombian beans coffee. You have a preference. I like Ethiopian. I don't like, I don't know, Colombian or whatever. But it's a coffee. Likewise, all mind is just cognizance. Okay? Now, okay, another analogy, like a water. Water, if you keep it alone, if you leave it alone, water is actually clear. But more you stir, it becomes muddy. Especially, if, let's say, in the situation of lake or a pond. If you stir, then it becomes muddy. The real water itself is just clear. This is why mind is trainable. Okay, I'm answering the question, is the mind trainable even possible? Because it really is a, see, it feels like a daunting task. How can ever I would manage to train my mind? That's just like, there's so much challenge. I mean, social media, advertisement, um, news channels, I don't know, um, family, friends, books, podcast, movies. I don't know, good view, bad view, good neighbor, bad neighbor. <clears throat> and then, of course, also that. And then also job. More and more, as you know, our world is so kind of designed so that you will be just trapped into this sort of trap is designed to pay the bills, pay the bills, pay the bills, make some money, make some money, and the pay the bills, pay the bills, and the little bit of money, you buy this and that gadgets, and then there's something new come, you know, it's, and then the tax, pension plan, it's just so designed so that you feels like you, how can we get out of this? How is this ever possible? But actually, it is very possible, you know. It's at the end of the day, it's all in your hand, right? Whether you would walk into <coughs> R.M. William or not. I was thinking about R.M. William, that's why. Whether I would buy an extra blunt stone <laughs> or not. I already have, but I like the blunt stone so much. I don't know, it looks just so good. And it's, it's like an all season kind of thing. I can wear it in the monasteries, I can wear it in front of the Japanese, in front of, I don't know, Tibetan, in front of Indians, I don't know. So, but at the end, it's always in my hand, actually. Um, what am I saying? Yes, so this, um, yes, it's really daunting. It looks like it's almost impossible. There's always a bills to pay, plan, scheduling. Oh. This is the, you know, Buddhists talk about many different types of suffering, pain, dukkha. Yeah, I think they should now add like dukkha of scheduling and dukkha of remembering the password. <laughs> Stuff like this. Just too much. You know, I spent some time with some American friends of mine in a coffee shop, about three hours talking. Half, that, half of that, they were condemning um, North America 
North Korea for not having easy access to internet, social media, Instagram, they don't have that. It's all like blocked here, 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 here. Half the time we, they've been going on and on and on about that. Then suddenly it switched. I don't know how. I should have really recorded because I could make a really good movie. It went to how the social media is really, f you know, pe making people fight each other, you know, family f are falling apart, people are shooting each other because of social media. So, mm, that's, that's how it is, isn't it? So, mm, Going back to these, all these influence are everywhere. So it feels like a very, very daunting. But question is, is it even possible to train mind very much? Very, very much. This is the good news. Um, <clears throat> you just need to know how and how do we do it? I think we already did it before. You remember this? And remember, like just before we kind of you know, just watched, even that, it already has every um, tools you, you need, actually. You don't need anything else. This already has it. But what you need is a um, few things you need to know. One trick, especially if you are a beginner, never do it long, please. Even if you want to show off, don't do it. Short is the answer. As short as one minute. This you should really, if you are seriously wanting to train your mind, you should really keep this in mind. This is a 2,500 years old advice that really worked and is still working. Yun Tung Tang Mang. Short, very, very short. One minute, three minutes you're already pushing. Don't do it, really. If you are new, please. I beg you, I beg you because I want you to like this mind training. I'm sort of the mind training sort of, you know, I'm trying to sort of sell this, right? I want you to like this. And by you overdoing it, you will end up not liking it. And you will end up not doing it. So short is the answer. And but as many times as possible. And how do you do it? Never ever think that you should only do it when you have horizon, you know, beach kind of vista. It's very strange. You never seem to see in a coffee shop somebody sort of, you know, just doing the so-called samadhi meditation. But there are a few in Bondi Beach gazing at the sunset. <laughs> it's a bad, bad advertising for meditation. It's really bad. Because it, this make it look like sunset, ocean, dusk, some birds ch chirping, probably even some incense. This is the all the ingredient you need. You are going to deprive yourself. So no need. Even as you are sitting in the toilet doing your business, you should be able to do this. And two, three minutes, right? There. You, <laughs> but you, you, but you, most probably you will be now already addicted to looking at your phone. I heard some people, their thing doesn't even come out. 
unless there is a phone in their hand. <laughs> it's like, it's like babies, they need s <laughs> You know, like s You need a phone for the things to come out. <laughs> I heard. Uh, so, anywhere, anytime, holy place, uh, serious place, um, volatile place, calm place, under the tree, um, inside a bus, wherever. Again? Okay, so this is actually the trick. Short, but many times. Um, yes, because this is so important. Because, give you the logic, your enemy, if the Buddhist ever have an enemy, if the Buddhists have to come up with a Satan of Buddhism, Satan, right, evil force, Buddhist equivalent to, you know, Satan is habit. Habit, habit, addiction. That is what is making us go crazy. But the problem is you need another Satan to destroy this Satan. So actually, so-called mind training is none other than just another habitual pattern trying to fight with the other pattern. And then remember, right in the beginning, I have quoted Chandrakirti, idiot goes to hell, idiot goes to heaven, wise one, going beyond good and bad, and then go to liberation. So, obviously, Buddhist aim is not to become a good meditator. For goodness sake, you need to write this down. Your aim is not to become a good meditator. You should reach to a stage where you don't have to meditate anymore. That should be. If you want to go to the other shore, your goal is to reach the other shore, not like good roar in the boat, like, like whole day, whole week, whole month, whole lifetime. You have become so, you know, with a lot of muscle, really good at rowing, but you never reach. What's the point? That should be your aim. So short. And many times. So that, so that's, um, actually it's here, so I was actually taking this, uh, this uh, chance to answer the question, but also cover the, uh, some of the points. I've already, um, okay, then, We have covered quite a bit of uh, mind training skill, uh, especially more from the ultimate level. Now, the ultimate level, ultimate or how should I call it? Um, sort of more serious level, okay? Serious? But actually, it's very simple. More to the, to the truth, closer to the truth, more serious Buddhist method actually ends up becoming more simple. This is always the case. If you read the Buddhist text, it's always like that. More complicated, more colorful, more story-ridden, more technique-ridden, Actually, they're there 
but they are further from the truth. But they are all aimed for the truth. But they are important because you will like it. This, you know, just watching this moment thought, I know at the moment you may get, you may think, some of you may think, ah, this I can do. Not that easy. Why not easy? Because it's not interesting. We have the one big problem, which is always fishing for something exceptional, interesting, and exotic. This is always the problem. We don't like anything that is like simple and just, we don't like. Complication is what we like. It's really strange. You may think you are, just make it simple. No. You, your mouth says, make it simple, but your, your habit is always longing for complication. Now, you want complications? We have 84,000 of them. <laughs> so many stuff. Mantras, this, that, diet, dietary suggestions, uh, whatever, so many. Uh, some of them I've told you, remember earlier, uh, like a flags, prayer flags, uh, amulets, like this. I'm wearing it, you know, things like this. My own mind training in many levels. It also causes me panic because sometimes I, I, uh, I, you know, I'm afraid that I've lost it. But this is complications, but we like it. We will like these complications. So I'm not going to go through all the other complications, but one thing that I will share, which is one of the most popular one that is taught in the Mahayana, uh, Mahayana uh, training, which is, okay, let's begin with, okay, so let's go step by step, this one. Okay, this one has a little bit of a steps. Okay, this one, now I'm making it complica complicated. Earlier I said, just watch the thought. That's it. Now I'm asking you to watch your breathing in and out. And actually it's good because you feel that there is something to watch at because you are breathing. The m watching the mind is so fast and invisible and so boring and frustrated. Did, did I watch? Was that it? No. I didn't watch. No. 20 minutes later, you realize you didn't do anything, stuff like that. <laughs> but this one, you can watch. Breathing. Now, you may think, why breathing? Why not something else? Like, why not just count your fingers? Which is also there, by the way, it's called Lutembani Varshapa, which means uh, the mindfulness of the body, right? But here, breathing, that's important. Breathing that you do, poetically, I could even call your breathing in and out, vibration of your mind. It's so closely related to your mind. This is why when you are sad or angry, <sighs> helps, because it's related. Yeah? So, 
And if you don't breathe anymore, what, what does that mean? You are dead. So breathing obviously is important. So you can watch breathing. Just watch the breathing in, out, in, out. That's it. That's all. No color, no lights, no nothing. That, this is a very good one. This one, by the way, because it's a complicated, therefore, you may not be able to do this breathing exercise, breathing mindfulness, if you just happen to sit next to somebody who farted. <laughs> the mind watching, you can do it no matter what kind of, how many fart there is. You can still, probably you can do it even more. You understand your annoyance and your, I don't know, all of that you can watch. But this one, pr probably, especially if you are too, you know, virus conscious and all of that, you might want to do it alone or, uh, yeah, Byron Bay or Bondi Beach probably is good or early in the morning or uh, in your room or stuff like that. So this is what I mean, more complicated, more colorful, more tangible, seemingly one way easy to do but also it has its own you know like challenges you can't do it everywhere stuff like that so that's one okay as i said earlier i'm not going to finish you know i mean like completely like uh, one after another, that's whole seven points. But basically, whatever I'm going to, whatever we are going to do today, it will cover um, all the uh, mind training, hopefully. And uh, if you want more sort of uh, systematic sort of reading, there's just plenty of liturgy you can uh, refer to. So I will suggest that. Okay, now, one of the most revered and really, really, what is it, cherished mind training, Tonglen, so cherished. So basically, the technique is very simple. Technique is you breathe in, and this time, little bit more complicated than earlier. Earlier, remember, just watch breathing in and out. This time, when you breathe in, all the problems of the world, everything, problems of the world, cause of the problems of the world, they're all, you breathe in. You breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. When you breathe out, all the goodness, the compassion, the peace, harmony, whatever, rainbow, if you like, all the goodness comes out and give it to others. You, if you can especially choose somebody, let's say your friend, for instance, somebody suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, breathe in, breathe out. Give your good things to your friend. And then you can extend that to families, village, district, country, universe, like that. Now, this is one of the trademark of the Kadamba people. It's a really, really, one cannot emphasize more. It's a really good. I will give you some reason why. For one, one reason, an important reason, this is one of the big game changer of your mind, mental habit. Because usually, all the good things, 
because you cherish yourself, right? That's all we think about. The modern society, especially, century of self. By the way, that's a really good um, program that you can watch in uh, BBC. Um, I, I do watch BBC, by the way. You know, some of you I know. Some of you know you you know that I condemn BBC, but you know. Uh, anyway, there's a really good episode. I think it's six episode. I think it's called Century of Self. I think so. I think yeah, you should watch this. It's about Edward Edward Burney, giant advertising person. Really good. How we <laughs> we we you know like brainwash. You know how things brainwash ourselves? Anyway, yes, this is very much century of self. And that's the problem. That's not only the problem between, you know, the different nations. It's a problem with the individually. Relationship doesn't work because we have been told that Self is the most important. Yourself is the most important. You are the, what do you call it? Megalomaniac, sort of big person. That's what the book says, the press, podcast, advertising, everything. Now you are trying to have a relationship. If person who are having, the person who you are trying to have relationship is, of course, ideally, if this person doesn't have a self cherishing, perfect relationship, everything will work out very well. But sadly, it's not like that. The other person is also very much cherishing the self. And if the other person has selfish, self-cherishing, but no mouth, no ear, or doesn't speak your language, let's say if the other being is a dog or a cat, actually works much better. This is why I think the you know, animals and us, they don't really complain. We, we just interpret whatever they do as some sign of I don't know, liking or disliking. If we could treat our boyfriend and girlfriend and the husband and the wife, that's how it, then it will work. But it's never like this. So, normally there's the habit of putting everything, all importance to the self. This one, Tonglen, you actually, mind training, remember? Doesn't mean that from today onwards you give your blunt stone to somebody else. No. You're training mind by breathing out, give everything to others. Good things. Bad things, you. Because it, you know, this training is making this self cherishing really derailed with its normal way of thinking and doing things. So, I mean, there's so many, many, many benefit and why I, we have no time to discuss this. Tonglen, that's one. Mm, it really yeah, disrupts the normal way of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, how n normally we uh, generate our uh, normal way of m manifesting our mind so that our mind ends up becoming rigid, limited, so much prejudice, so much hope and fear. This is why your mind is not malleable. 
you cannot make it. Your mind is like a piece of wood, stubborn. No space. So you can't really say you are angry. You can't tell somebody, wait a minute, I'm going to stop my anger in five seconds. Cannot really. But by doing this, yes, probably, most probably, in about a few months, you are angry, and then you can tell your friend, okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, no anger. Very possible. This is, anyway, too much information. Um, Beside that, there are other methods which I'm not really elaborating here, like there's so many Kadamba advice, like how you should really say it. You should even have things like you should kind of try to sleep early. I think. Um, most probably you are not even interested to hear those things, so I'm not, I'm going to skip these things. <coughs> who will, who will like to hear sleep early? <laughs> That's the worst thing. Actually, who would, a lot of people don't want to even hear sit. That's a, such a bad sounding word, sit. <laughs> like talking to a dog or something. Okay, now, just, yeah, the, another one. Then, you do that, do that, you apply this method, apply this method. This is important. Then, what will happen if you put some effort, as I said, short time, many times, Tonglen, all of that. Then, what will happen is, your way of valuing, your way of stressing, emphasizing, interpreting, assuming, your way of taking for granted will change. Obviously, right? Because you are poking holes with your normal habit. So I've used this example before. Some of you must have heard this before. Let's say you are, what do you call it? Is there an equal word, equivalent to word like OCD or something like someone who is so obsessed with the cleanliness? What do you call them? OCD? Oh, OCD. If somebody who is so OCD washes underwear five times a day, Obsess, even irons them. You do this. After about a year, you won't probably you won't wash your underwear. <laughs> Doesn't matter, clean or not. Okay. Well, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter, some wrinkles here, shirt, I don't know, everything. What you watch, okay, you forgot to download your episodes, oh, it doesn't matter. You forgot to, you missed the, I don't know, episodes, it doesn't matter. You know, that kind of, you know, there's a, some changes happening. What is, used to be very important, not so important. What you, what you used to take for granted things, you don't. You see, remember I was reciting the er, um, poetry? See, we take for granted the fly uh, washing, what, what, rubbing their hand. There's something so beautiful about it. This guy seems to have noticed. We take for granted frog jumping in the pond. Yeah, of course, it's so amazing, right? Sound of water. Have you ever thought about that? 
that's quite an amazing thing. So, a lot of things that you take for granted, you also don't, don't take for granted. So, all this will change. Now, then what? Then, now, very important for the mind training people, you should never, ever become fanatical towards your method. That's it. You should not become fanatical. So, okay, six months ago, underwear wash, remember? Then you do mind training. Now, you don't really mind, okay, this is maybe <laughs> clean, maybe not clean. So you are more relaxed. Now you are happy that you are less OCD. Now you are becoming very fanatical about this path, this religion. This is not good. That's what it is talking about, basically. So, actually, you should wash your underwear. You sh because in order to inspire others, so that in other people won't sort of get offended, you coming with the smelly stuff, you know, so that you will <laughs> sort of communicate with the world, you know, the compassion stuff, you understand? And what do you call it? Um, being able to, ma you know, manage to talk with the people. This absolutely important. A uh, few more. Uh, I know there are some questions. unexpected situation arise, especially negative situation arise, such as a failure, such as a disease, such as dispute. When unexpected, un, you know, unfavorable circumstance or situation arise, you should Take it as your challenge. If you are learning how to drive, you can't be just learning in this room day after day after day after. If you really want to be a good driver, you learn, of course, in this room without anybody here, of course. If you really want to become a good driver, go to Nepal and drive. <laughs> Dogs, welcome. Cows, welcome. Pothole, welcome. Because it will only help you. How to Other people driving past you, other people driving towards you, block cart, I don't know, whatever. This is my challenge. Likewise, you get headache, failure, somebody creating scandals towards you, this is it. I'm going to drive better. This is what it is, basically. Taking unfavorable uh, circumstance into the path. Okay, lastly. Remember? Lojong mind training for Buddhists is useless if there is no next life. If there is no next life, why should we? You know, we are sitting on a cushion. You are missing a lot of good things out there. A lot of fun, you know. You should just do whatever. If they, you know, this is what Buddhists think. If there is no next life, yeah, whatever works. Whatever makes your life rich and powerful and happy. Go rob a bank. 
As long as they don't catch you, doesn't matter. Cheat people. As long as people don't know, doesn't matter. That's how the Buddhists think. So, this is the, yeah, okay. So you are going to die, for sure. So since you are going to die, how is this Lojong mind training? Because since that seems to be our main sort of goal, right? That's the main goal. Now, for those who don't accept next life, doesn't matter. Just hear it. Who knows? After you die, <laughs> you may stumble into this situation that there is a next life. Then you may need this information. Right? If there's no next life, no problem. But might as well just hear it. So, as you die, what will happen? Your mind and the body is going to separate, okay? I'm going to sort of talk more hypothetically because I have to sort of build this case. Uh, I don't know whether it's a lawful to talk like this, but I don't know, I'm sure there's a plenty of people here who has taken mushrooms, right? Hallucinogenic? Cellucite, what do, you, what do you call it? Yeah. If there is anyone, you might understand what I'm talking about. Like ayahuasca, you know. What is happening at that time, from the Buddhist point of view, okay? By the way, Tantric Buddhism actually has a method of using these substances, like um, hallucinogenic stuff, as a as a means to mind train. Not, I don't think bang, what is bang? Marijuana, not marijuana, I don't think so. Because I think marijuana just makes you relax and happy. Remember, even mindfulness, we don't do it for happiness. Because that's just like, you are already dumb, why make you more dumb? Why, why want to, <laughs> you know, like, make you as a more dumb? You understand? But there is that practice. I hope this is not going to cause, not going to cause my next visa for Australia. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm only using this as an example. When you take the mushroom or whatever, these cellus, yeah, these substances, what happens, just from the Buddhist point of view, your body and mind is separating a little bit. Basically, you are dying a little bit for a few hours. Sort of, sort of a little bit. Let's say the death is here, and right now you are here. If you take mushroom, you have come close to this much. Maybe ayahuasca this much. You understand? It's just that. But when your body and mind is a little bit separated, there is an advantage, you, there is a really good advantage you should take. Because when your body and mind is separated, your mind becomes independent. For the first time, you don't have all your attendants and your friends and your interpreters. You have usually six interpreters or the five interpreters, eyes, nose, tongue. You are the mind, right? So you look at somebody, it's always through an interpreter who actually is not well versed with the language. Imagine that you have been communicating with the world with five bad translators. Five bad, moody, 
schizophrenic, bull, uh, what do you call bipolar, bipolar uh, translators. So you are looking through that. But when you are dying, those translators are collapsing. So you are independent now. Finally, you look at this door. You, finally, you look at this door as you. Finally, you look at this flower as you. Now, this is a beautiful chance for you. So this is why mind training therefore helps when you are dying. How? When you are dying, instead of thinking that this is it, this is the end, you, may, you will actually think this is the beginning. You will even plan bigger. Well, from the Buddhist point of view, to benefit all sentient beings, to awaken all sentient beings, to make all the sentient beings into the Buddha, Buddha field. That's a big project, you know. So one life is not enough. So you have to be a very visionary. How do we do that? Mind training. Okay, so I think I will now let you finish some of these questions. Maybe I think, um, do we have the questions? How many questions do we have? Okay, three questions, please. Um, yes. Kusu Sampola, Rinpoche. So you said today that um, being a Buddhist, the ultimate goal is not about you know, peace or happiness, but really liberation. So as a Buddhist, how can we avoid the pitfall of the seduction of thinking that we are on the path to liberation? Meaning, um, we practice for liberation, but this liberation, how do we avoid thinking oh, that, you know, this is I think, towards liberation? Yes. I think I've already told you, you should not become fanatical with your method. That's it. Abandon the boat once you reach the other shore. That's what Buddha said. Okay. Rinpoche, can you please tell us uh, something about the Buddhist view of suicide? What is karma and how can we overcome it? Suicide. Suicide? Yes. Right. Wow, that's a big question. Now, <clears throat> Okay. This will sound very technical and philosophical or, I don't know, theoretical. Buddhist sees suicide, suicidal men, uh, mind purely as a habitual mind. Sometimes when the habit gets out of control, you actually perform the act of killing. Now, not just suicide, Buddhists have always been very wary about how much you get entangled with any kind of karma, actually. Remember, I already quoted you. you ED does good thing, go to hell. ED does bad, uh, I mean, good thing, go to heaven, bad thing, go to hell. You are supposed to go beyond. So this actually is an important quotation. Now, Okay, so, that, so suicide mind is a habitual mind. And therefore, it's a very, very kind, kind of a um, vicious um, and also, uh, again, it is very much rooted to um, self-cherishing uh, habitual pattern. And um, I think the question, did you, I think the question has the element how to, how to deal with this. Okay, whatever the mind training we have been talking, it's 
really, really good because I think suicide mind has a lot of uh, assumption, expectations, fear, um, taking for granted, so many of this entanglement. So instead of get, you know, encouraging you to uh, get more entangled, always coming back to this simple whatever you are thinking. And if you can't do that, just the breathing. This should really, really help a lot. Uh, plus, there are many other methods, such as releasing life. There's a Buddhist sort of a ritual. Such, well, if you're a tantric Buddhist, then there's a mantras, there's a mudras, there's a rituals, there's a visualizations, so on and so forth. But we have no time explaining all that. Okay. Thank you. I've heard old Tibet was a highly political and feudal society. How much of that is still a part of the culture of Tibetan Buddhism, including amongst Tibetan lamas and principal Rinpoches like yourself? Very good. <laughs> is that the last question? There's one more afterwards. Okay. Or two. <laughs> yeah, maybe two more questions after this. Okay. Um, can you repeat that question again? I already forgot. <laughs> can you read it slowly? I've heard old Tibet was a highly political and feudal society. How much of that is still a part of the culture of Tibetan Buddhism, including amongst Tibetan lamas and principal Rinpoches like yourself? Yes, it was really a highly feudal society. I have to say, a lot of outsiders have very rosy picture of uh, maybe not only the past, even the present, you understand? They, one need to really look into uh, reality. You know, human beings everywhere are similar thing. Um, one need to also make a difference between Buddhism and Buddhist. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. Now, this is actually a very interesting challenge for people like me, who supposedly has stake Buddhist, you know, sort of who holds the responsibility. Uh, Tibetan culture and the Dharma, Buddhism, they are not one, they are not same. Tibet, Tibetan culture is like the cup and the Dharma, like the mind training is like the coffee inside. It helps to have a cup. You can use many different kinds of cup. It helps. But what you want is to drink coffee, not the cup. Uh, but many times we get so involved with what kind of cup we are going to have. Less people think about the cup. I mean, uh, coffee. There's that. Now, there's another angle though. Culture also does help though. You see, this is the challenging part. Um, without all that, in one way, these sort of institute, monasteries, high lamas, ranked lamas, all of that, I don't know whether the Tibetan Buddhism today will alive as much as this. It's, it's a very, very like a double-edged sword, isn't it? Mm. One good thing though is in the Tibetan history, there were so many, many great masters, probably more great masters than those who are very high-ranked you know, high ranked, ranking is a very, very worldly business. So there's a lot of high ranked lamas, but you know, so many high ranked lamas, 
but there was also many, no rank, but incredible people like Milarepa, for instance. He doesn't even have things to wear, let alone rank. So there was a really good balance because there was always this kind of people, Milarepa kind of people, who is always like bugging, you know, this is not the way. But on the other hand, we need to also realize many of these highly ranked lamas, there were also, there were a lot of good ones. And because of their influence, the Buddhist institute, Buddhist, I don't know, atmosphere, Buddhist culture, all of that actually um, is going on. Now, fast forward, year 2023, almost 24, and especially those who are not a Tibetan, for you, unless you are studying Tibet, Tibetology, Tibetan culture is actually not your goal. Now this is a problem though, because Tibetan culture can be very, very exotic, and, you know, you know, sometimes we like to wear tuxedo. Sometimes we like to wear <laughs> Tibetan dress. Sort of, it's not, you know, I don't know. Especially if you f feel like flaunting that you are a Dharma practitioner, you know, a mala hanging on your neck, your hand, all of this also helps, I guess. But connected to this, it is it is something that lamas, Rinpoche's, like myself, and also the students, also the patrons, this is something that we need to be really closely scrutinizing and watching out what can be done. Especially, because as you can see, the mind training, that one has got nothing to do with the Tibetan culture or Australian or you know, Fijian or Indonesian, that one can be done with anybody, with everyone. But the tool we use, how to do that, is going to be a bit of a challenge, okay? How do we deal with a middle-aged or post-middle-aged crisis? <laughs> Are you talking, yeah, that's me, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> I will um, try to say more positive. <laughs> There's something good about being middle-aged because I think you begin to see the world with a little bit of the bird's eyes view. And I think we should, you know, you have done this, done that, been here, been there. Now I think one should use that you know, experience to really project the life. Uh, I think that's about all I can say. This is nothing much I can say here. Um, okay, yeah. You spoke of sentient beings and said that a table is not sentient, but how do we know that a table doesn't have a mind? What if it does feel lonely when we all leave, but it expresses it in a way we cannot comprehend or understand? Oh, you are very right. I actually don't know. <laughs> I actually don't know. But it's a just an, you know, assumption. There's a something called inanimate and animate, right? So, yeah, there's, so, um, yes, table could be, uh, yeah, have some mind. <laughs> which, which means that, thank you so much, um, all of you for sitting through like this and thank my table for, <laughs> you know, keeping my things intact here. And um, please um, have a good weekend. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Rinpoche. Thank you. Yes. Okay, just a few reminders before we leave. The uh, doors open at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Please have your QR code ready for registration as you will receive a new wristband. Uh, a reminder to take all of your things with you today as we will be shifting the hall around. And tomorrow, please bring a cushion if you have indicated you would like to sit on one. However, we do only have limited spaces, so there is a chance that you may be seated in a chair. And on another note, a yellow Longchamp bag has gone missing from the owner's chair during the break today. If anybody has seen it, please return it to the lost and found at, located at the help desk in the front foyer. And a reminder for everybody to please keep their valuables on themselves. Uh, um, can everybody please stay for one moment? And the SI instructors and Rinpoche's other organizations, uh, 84,000 and the Kensi Vision Project and the Lotus Outreach are represented at tables in the front foyer beyond, beyond the registration area. Please pay them a visit. For any Dharma related inquiries, Please see our team of SI instructors available from 9 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. 在我們的門廳服務台那裡有西大多本院會,還有相關的非營利組織,比如說連心基金會,八萬四千等等一些組織的代表員在那裡有展示桌,大家可以去那裡了解一下. For those people who have offered to help reorganize the venue, if you could just stay back, please and congregate just to the side here, the right side of the stage, for instruction. Thank you. <笑><笑><笑><笑> Okay, okay.